Welcome to The Savvy Sauce, where we have practical chats for intentional living. I'm your host, Laura Duggar, and I'm so glad you're here. Today's episode includes some thematic material. I want you to be aware before you listen in the presence of little ears. Castaway Kid is one of the most powerful books I have ever read. Rob Mitchell's story, Growing Up as a Lifer in an American Orphanage, is eye-opening. And today he graciously shares a glimpse into his life of growing up and experiencing loneliness, rejection, and then ultimately restoration, only because of God's grace. I learned so much about forgiveness and generosity during our time together, and I can't wait to share it with you. Here's our chat. Welcome to the Savvy Sauce, Rob. Thank you so much, Laura. It's a thrill to be here. Well, I have never met someone with a story quite like yours, and I know that you're known to have an uncanny memory. And much of your life has actually been documented. So in your book, you open with a heart-wrenching memory as a three-year-old boy. Can you take us back to that moment? People don't believe that three-year-olds can remember a whole lot. But kids in crisis, kids like I once was, when we have that crisis moment, we either block it out and never remember or we never forget. And I won't forget that moment. Uh, My father had abandoned my mother and I put a gun to his head, pulled the trigger, tried to commit suicide, failed, ended up living the next 26 years in a mental hospital as a walking vegetable. He could walk, but he could not talk. He could put food in his mouth, but not always chew and swallow. He could put his pants on, but not remember where or when to go to the bathroom. And for 26 years, a man with a master's degree from prestigious Northwestern University wore diapers till the day he died. My mother had tremendous emotional and psychological problems that she had masked prior to marriage, but in marriage, those masks come down. And three months after my father's failed suicide attempt, she drug me from Chicago, Illinois in January by train to a little town called Princeton, Illinois. And those memories are very, very vivid. It was cold. There was snow on the sidewalk. She's dragging me five blocks from the train station. My little legs can't keep up. I'm whimpering. I'm scared. Something's wrong. And my mother's yelling at me, shut up, Robbie. Shut up. And she drags me in this great big three-story building, commands me to play with blocks with a strange boy. I reach for a block and he steals it. I reach for a block and he steals it. I turn to my mother for help and she's gone. She didn't say I love you. She didn't say I'll miss you. She didn't say I'll come back and see you when I'm well, she's just gone. And a strange woman whose name and face I don't remember says, Robbie, your mother's sick. She's taking the train back to Chicago. She'll come back and get you when she's well. And I remember running to the nearest door, but I'm only three years old and I can't reach the handle anyway. I don't know where it goes. I'm crying. This woman's yelling at me, shut up. Quit crying or I'll spank you. I cannot quit crying. My mother has abandoned me. And this strange woman picks me up and spanks me over and over and over again until the pain of being spanked is worse than the pain of being abandoned. That night I wet the bed and she spanks me again. As punishment puts two brown rubber sheets on my bed, makes me lie between them all day long the next day. And they're hot and they squeak when I move. And I still remember the boys and the strange boys and the strange place my mother has abandoned me, laughing at me because the new kid's a pee-pee baby. And then my memories go blank. Wow. I knew that this part wouldn't be easy to hear more about. But now will you walk us through more of your childhood? It was a tough childhood, Laura. There's no doubt about it. I remember one day a man who became a friend of mine big, tall, six foot four, ex-Marine, Vietnam POW. He and I knew each other, but he didn't know my testimony. And the first time he heard me give it, he came up to me just weeping. And I mean, this is a manly man. And I knew he'd been a POW in Vietnam for three years. And he said, 
I was trained for that. I was a 20-year-old man. I was trained for the brutality and the violence of war. He said, you were just three. There's no way you could have been prepared for that. And, you know, I say that with no pride. It's just, I'm just one of millions of little kids. And the title of my book is Castaway Kid. And I'm so grateful it's now translated into seven languages. But one of the reasons it's Castaway Kid is there are very few true orphans in the world. The United Nations says there's 163 million, but most of us, like I was, have at least one biological parent somewhere. I was never a technical orphan. I was just cast away. We go through, some of it is worse than others, some of it's just absolute nightmare abuse, psychological, physical, and sexual abuse. And that's why the title of my book is Castaway Kid, because we're really not true orphans. We're just thrown away. And I know that you've encouraged so many through this book where you just share, like I said, with an uncanny memory, all of these experiences. And you grew up in what most people would describe as an orphanage. Do orphanages still exist in the United States? Not exactly. It, it was a children's home. There still are 550 Christian children's homes in America today. So I hired an assistant a couple of years ago to build a database of all Christian children's homes, Christian adoption groups, foster care, and mentoring groups. They're not connected. In America, we almost never call them orphanages. A few did, but we don't call them orphanages. Around the world, and I've spoken from Budapest, Hungary, over Europe, South America, and last year the communist Chinese government invited me as only one of two foreigners to speak at their first ever national conference on child welfare. And they were going to have me back again this year, but the virus hit. Everywhere else in the world they're called orphanages, but in America we call them children's homes. And there's there's a good 500 plus still operating in America. They just seem to be hidden in the background. And especially from the, the church, the church kind of walked away from children's homes in the 70s and let the government take over. And, you know, I regret that, but that's another discussion. But they're very much around and very much active, and the need is just as great as it was when they were first founded. Wow, thank you for that educational piece. I can't believe I'm not aware of any of these resources, and that's interesting. You said they're hidden. What do you think the purpose is in that, that most of us are not aware that these places exist in America? My honest answer to that is the majority of society doesn't want to know. In the South, there's an old saying, if it's inconvenient and uncomfortable and unpleasant, we don't talk about it. Because if there are kids like I once was in institutional care, then it pricks a guilt in people that maybe they should do something. And if they're not aware, then they're not pricked by that guilt. Now, I'm not doing a guilt trip by saying this, because I don't do guilt trips. I think people should go as God leads. And I'm not opposed to, I, I prefer group homes over institutional. And I have spoken at more children's homes and group homes than I can name, at least in 40 states in America, not counting foreign nations, both to be an encouragement to the kids, especially, that's my first priority, but also encouragement to the staff. Because the staff gets so burned out, they see so little success, and I want to be an encouragement to them as well that somewhere in their care is another Robbie, another little boy, another little girl who just needs a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more love to get that new vision for themselves that they are more than just a kid from an orphanage. They're more than just thrown away garbage, that they are a child of God and that God has a different vision for them if they will just grasp it and start working towards becoming the man or woman God imagines them to be, not the man or woman their childhood says they're doomed to be. 
And I think for any of us listening, if we are interested in helping out, sometimes it helps to be connected with what someone actually lived through. And so we won't go through all of this because it's in your book, but could you give us an overview of different parts of your childhood to show us what it was like? So I was the last one to ever live their entire childhood in the Covenant Children's Home. And the Covenant Children's Home was a good place. It was sparse and spartan because money was always a problem. In order to save money, we only took baths twice a week. Now, my first next memory is a wonderful dorm mother named Nola, who was in Bible college in Bemidji, Minnesota, when she came to take care of kids like us. And she came when I was about four and a half or five. Nola had at that time, they don't do it this way anymore, between 10 and 15 little boys, ages 3 to 10, by herself, five and a half days a week. Laura, can you imagine? That would be a lot of people to attend to. A lot of little people to attend to. And especially the fact that the kids that showed up, like me, We bring our past. We bring our anger. We bring our abuse. We bring our nightmares. We're not cute little fuzzies on the inside because we don't know what's going on. And so we took baths twice a week, Wednesday and Saturday nights. We thought on little boys that was once a week too often. We also only had two bathtubs for 16 little boys in order to save hot water, money and hot water, six to the same bath water and two at a time. So the first two got clean, the second two kind of got clean, and the third set just got wet and had fun. People wonder what it was like to spend my whole childhood there. Again, I was the last lifer, and they really never wanted someone to spend their whole life there, and that's part of my weird story. But the first adjective is very regimented. Nothing happened till the bell rang. But before the bell rang at 7 in the morning to get up, Nola would get up an hour early and go into the locker room. Laura, every children's home, group home, orphanage in every country, in every nation, in every language has a locker room. Because kids like us often show up with only the clothes on our back. So there's always extra clothes that have been donated. And Nola would try and make the clothes she had fit the boys she had. In the book, Castaway Kid is a photograph of a bunch of little boys sitting around. They gave us candy so we'd sit still long enough to take a picture. But I'm the little boy on the left, and I'm wearing suspenders and rolled up pant legs, as are half the other little boys. That wasn't to be stylish, Laura. That was to keep my pants on. The bell would ring at 7. We'd stampede to the bathroom. Two toilets, 16 little boys. It weren't pretty. Go in the locker room, get the clothes on, Noah laid out. And I remember her telling me one time that she would have eight and nine and ten year old little boys who'd already been so traumatized in their little lives that they did not know how to tie their shoes. We'd line up like a little boy army, punching and shoving, stomp downstairs for breakfast at seven thirty, lunch was noon, cookies and juice after school, supper's five thirty, and then they locked the kitchen. If you were hungry at 8 o'clock at night, tough. Go to the bathroom, cup your hand, drink tap water. They weren't being mean. There just wasn't any money for snacks and staff to set it out and clean it up. And this was true even when I was a teenager on what we called big boys. You're hungry, you know, teenagers consume food 24 hours a day. But if you're hungry at 8 o'clock at night, it was tap water. And the NOLA would gather us in the one family room. For Bible study time, and that was every night after we got our jamas on, and she'd put the littlest boys in the couch next to her, the bigger boys on the floor. Nola was very serious about Bible study time, Laura. She did not tolerate goofing off. And I have very clear memories of her holding a Bible story book in one hand and smacking a misbehaving boy with the other. And we actually saw no theological conflict with that whatsoever. Then she'd take us to bed one by one, the littlest ones at 7.30, the oldest at 9.30. And no matter how much chaos was going on in the hall, she took us to bed one by one. She'd say a quick prayer, kiss my cheek, hug my neck, and always say, Remember, Robbie, God loves you and I love you. 
And when she'd leave to get another little boy, I would often lay there and think, okay, it's pretty easy to believe Nola loved me, but if her God loves me, this Christian God she talks about loves me, how come my childhood is such a mess? Where is this loving Heavenly Father Nola talks about? I'm not feeling it. We slept four to eight to a room, industrial strength beds. You could not break them. We tried. And Nola had a room on the hall, not an apartment, a room. And she, after she changed her pajamas, she'd keep the door open to hear what was going on. And I remember getting up one night and paddling to the bathroom and hearing her praying for each of us by name. And Laura, that was really special because kids like us are invisible. Our families don't want us. Society doesn't want us. But when somebody knows your name, you're no longer invisible. I came paddling back from the bathroom and Nola hollers, go to bed, Robbie. Now, Laura, you're a mother of four. You'll understand this. Nola hollers. And I remember thinking to myself, how do you know who I am just by my footsteps? But I'm sure, Laura, you know your girl's footsteps. So I, being smart, Alec, I knocked on her door frame and I said, what you doing, Nola? Praying we behave. And in her matter of fact, northern Minnesota manner, she said simply, no, Robbie, I'm praying that God helps me find something to love in each one of you. And I didn't know what to say to that, Laura, because kids like us are not lovable. As I said earlier, we bring our past to the children's home. We bring our nightmares and our abuse and our anger and our rage. We are not easy to love. But Nola was intent on finding something to love in each one of us. So the first adjective I think I would say is very regimented, but also lots of anger and confusion. And then the second thing would be desperate loneliness, because kids are egocentric. We think whatever happens to us in life is our fault. The kid who grows up in a Beverly Hills mansion with million-dollar cars, they think they deserve that life. It's not true. That's what they think. But kids like us who grow up in places like this, oftentimes there's an adult out there that says, you're just as sorry as your mama. You're as worthless as your daddy. And we believe it because we're kids. And the longer we stay in places like this or in foster care and get bounced around from one place to another, I've heard kids tell me they were adults, tell me they were in 21 foster homes in their childhood. I mean, what good does that do a kid? Come on. So we're just kind of consumed with loneliness. Life in a children's home is very regimented, but internally it's also full of a lot of confusion for us, anger, rage, and loneliness. And I think one of the confusing parts, I'm assuming, for being so young was also this bouncing back and forth because you did have some extended family in Atlanta and you had some experiences certain times of the year where your mother would come back kind of as a tornado and stir things up. So can you walk us through what that looked like? to contrast the children's home from those other times of being in the presence of family? Yeah, so children, and I've talked to kids like us all over the world in every culture, and oftentimes when we're talking in small groups, I'll ask two questions. I'll say, how many of you are safer here in this children's home, orphanage, group home, whatever? How many of you are safer here, better fed, better clothed than whatever you call home? And almost all their hands always go up. And then I follow that question up with, how many of you want to go home? And almost all the hands go up, and then they start laughing, because they realize how silly it is to answer the second question after they answered the first question. But Laura, it's primordial. We all want to go home as kids. But kids like us want to go home to a mythology that does not exist. And I say that as preparation. My mother didn't show up again for almost three years. What nobody told me was she was in lockdown psychiatric ward, which she'd been in multiple times, multiple electroshock therapy. She abused drugs and alcohol, mostly lived on the streets of Chicago. I don't know if she prostituted herself. I never asked. She never told. But I'm on the playground. I'm about six. And somebody hollers, your mommy's here. I am so excited. I mean, she's been gone. She abandoned me three years ago. I'm so excited. Mommy's here. 
I get to go home. I go running up to the guest room, and my mother's in there, and she's yelling and cussing at Nola. And I'm thinking as I'm blowing into the room, Nola's a good person. Why are you cussing at her? And I hugged my mother's leg, and the next thing I remembered was how bad my mother smelled, because substance abusers smell bad. And my mother yells a little longer, and finally I couldn't take it. I said, Mommy, shut up. Let's take the train back to Chicago. Let's go home. And she looks down at me, and she says, I got to go. She didn't say, I love you. She didn't say, I'm sorry, I haven't written or called. She didn't hug me or kiss me. She just says, I got to go. And she just walks out the door. And I was so stunned, I'm six years old, that I literally did not talk for three weeks. And Nola and the caseworkers tried to get me just to say something. And I couldn't do it. I was just so stunned and shocked. I couldn't utter a word. And finally, the first words I did utter were, my heart hurts. And that was my mother. She'd show up unannounced. She'd bring her, you used a great word, her tornado of chaos. She eventually lost legal custody of me when I was in third grade. And then I found a whole new side of my family, the Mitchell family in Atlanta. They lived in Buckhead. One of them, of my grandfather's brothers, owned a Rolls-Royce Oldsmobile dealership, another owned Jeep Buick AMC, another was a multimillionaire insurance agent. They had country clubs, they had live-in servants. I'm like, what are you people doing leaving me in the Covenant Children's Home? And I expected to just never go back, but they put me on an airplane and flew me back. And I am totally confused. But I'm thinking, okay, they flew me back at summertime, I'll get a call, I'll fly back down in September, and that's where I'm going to live. Well, the call never came. The call never came. And next summer, they flew me down again. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be so good. I'm going to be super good. I'm not going to eat much food, so so they'll want to keep me. Because food's a big deal for kids like us. And so lots of times we go somewhere and there's a lot of food. We'll actually put it in our pockets and take it back with us because we don't always know when the next meal's coming. And they flew me back again. And this happened really the rest of my childhood. Finally, one summer, I probably was about 11, I said, I want to stay. Can't I stay here with y'all? And they just patted me on the head and smiled and said nothing. They didn't say yes. They didn't say no. They didn't even try and explain it. They just patted me on the head and smiled. Um, And as I write in my book, the silence said everything I did not want to hear. I eventually found out when I was about 19 that my father's mother wanted very much to be a high society country club superstar. And me living in Atlanta with my father in a mental hospital was a social embarrassment to her. So she would tell her friends that I simply lived in Illinois when I came up in conversation. And for her, it was more convenient to leave me in Illinois in the orphanage than to have me running around Atlanta and have to explain why I was down there without a mother or a father. The psychologist Rollo May once said that the opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. It's just when you don't care. So that just added a whole new bizarre twist. And when I realized that Atlanta wasn't going to raise me, then I kind of had to make a decision. And I did. And I thought, well, at least I get to quote, kind of go to Disneyland every summer instead of have to be stuck at the children's home. So I just kind of kept my mouth shut. I didn't lash out at Atlanta. I behaved and went down for two or three weeks every summer and made the best of it. I didn't abuse it, but I had fun and it was a vacation. And it was just another bizarre chapter in a bizarre childhood that still didn't really make sense to me. And as I hear this, I just think of the weight and the heavy load that you were bearing as such a young child trying to make sense of all of this. But even in your book, it just seems like you've experienced such deep thoughts, even as that little boy, little Ravi. So do you think you were born a naturally thoughtful kid? You know, Laura, that's a very, very valid question. I don't struggle with my answer in the sense of You'd be tempting to say, aw shucks, no, and try and be overly humble. It'd be tempting to say yes and sound arrogant. But I I do think that 
I was born with a sense of discernment. I do know that spiritually now as an adult, well, actually even a young adult, once I accepted Christ, that uh, I was about 19 or 20 when I realized that I had the gift of discernment of spirits. And, and I'm not not Pentecostal, but I'm not Pentecostal. And I would tell you that nobody should ask God to give them the gift of discernment of spirits. It's very much a double-edged sword. But even as a young kid, I was pretty able to see through, and I'll use the polite phrase, the BS of life. I didn't always understand the motive behind it, but I could see through when people weren't telling the truth or were hiding the truth. And I couldn't always see behind it, but I knew that was going on. There's something else, too, and I know that this started somewhere around eight years old. I can't pinpoint the date, but it was when I made a conscious decision that I was going to be more than a kid from an orphanage. Somehow, I was going to find a way. I figured I'd struggle and fail and struggle and fail, and I might fail miserably and be like so many of the other older boys who ended up dead or in prison before 21, oftentimes alcoholics and overdosing on drugs, killed in criminal activity. But I was a little snot when I made a vow to myself that somehow, and I didn't know how, I was going to find a way not to just be a kid from an orphanage. And so that started very much in little boys right around the time I was eight years old. We'll come back shortly after a brief message from our sponsor. I am so grateful for our sponsor, Plan to Eat. I have personally subscribed to their app for months, and I am pleased with their offerings and their customer service. The team has been helpful, responsive, and very kind. I've never experienced an app quite like this one. The founders say, we believe our physical and emotional health is directly tied to what we eat. Plan to Eat was born from our desire to eat real food, great food, prepared at home together as a family. Our hope is that Plan to Eat will be a tool to help you prepare delicious, wholesome food that nourishes both body and soul. So basically, Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website. Then you can create a meal plan around your schedule, and their software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. Plan to Eat is a subscription service that offers monthly and yearly options for $4.95 a month or $39 a year, which comes out to about 75 cents a week. And even better, Savvy Sauce listeners get a 60-day free trial requiring no payment information when they visit plantoeat.com slash savvy. I also want you to know we're approaching the date for the only sale they hold each year. Between November 27th and 30th of this year, you can purchase a single yearly subscription at 50% off, making your year of plan to eat only $19.50. Gift subscriptions are also included in this sale, so make sure you purchase your subscription or gift between November 17th to 30th, 2020. Again, visit plantoeat.com slash savvy for your free 60-day trial. I hope you check out Plan to Eat today. Thanks for your sponsorship. You alluded to this earlier, but it seemed like when you were younger, you were skeptical of faith for a while. Oh, yeah. But then how did your heart begin to soften? I always believed there was a God. I just didn't think God liked me. So I believe there was a God because, to me, creation screamed of a designer. If you just studied the eyeball, the eyeball is such a fantastic thing that, to me, the idea of random evolution was illogical. And I thought, this is a little kid. All of creation, the critical mix of gases that have to exist in the earth to breathe, the tolerances are so finite. This just couldn't happen by accident. To me, it it was obvious there had to be a master designer out there. So I always thought there was a God. I just didn't think God liked me because if God liked me, why am I in an orphanage my whole life? And I didn't know what I did to offend God, but that was my lot in life. So I was kind of fatalistic about that part. Nola did Bible studies and she prayed. We got drugged to church. And I've heard testimonies where people said Jesus was never preached in my church. And I don't believe that anymore. 
what I believe is, I mean, that's maybe true in some churches, but I think there's also churches where Jesus was preached and somebody didn't hear it. And that's different. But it was summer of before my senior year in high school, I got invited to be a lifeguard and swim instructor at Covenant Harbor Bible Camp in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is about two or three hours from the children's home. And I was elated. I got to spend the whole summer away from the home. I was trying to get rid of the name Robbie and be called Rob, but I just couldn't make it happen where I grew up. So at the camp, I was Rob. And I was intent on engaging in my favorite sport that summer, which was hunting and catching silly girls. I love that sport. They wanted to be caught. I wanted to catch them. What's the problem? Well, the problem was all these goody-two-shoe Christian girls working at the camp, and they figured out within a week what kind of wolf I was. And I kid you not, one of them got in my face with a frying pan, said, you get out of line, I'm going to smack you. And I remember wondering to myself, where do you breed females like this? And why? So I had to behave myself for a while. And one week, this cute, blonde-haired, blue-eyed missionary's daughter showed up. And I said, forget the frying pan. This hound is going to hunt. And the hunt was on. And Laura, she should have been afraid of me, but she wasn't. She had this incredible peace in Christ. And we're in a canoe on day two. And she asked me, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. I'm like, what? This is not in the Catch Silly Girls handbook. I said, I don't have one. I don't buy this whole loving Heavenly Father thing. It does not fit my reality. I thought that would end the conversation. She says, well, I don't think you've honestly examined the evidence. Now, teenage boys will do a lot of really stupid stuff to try and impress a girl, right? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Fair's kind. It's it's an understatement. And then we go back to where we live. We look in a mirror. We say, boy, that was stupid. And we grin. Uh, how the species survives sometimes, I don't know. She's cute. It's a book. I'll read some of it and impress her. So I started reading the Jesus books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Now I'd heard about Jesus, but I really thought he walked three feet above the ground, never got his feet dirty. He got his feet dirty. He got hungry. He got tired. He got thirsty. He got betrayed by people he should have been able to trust. That one I understood. And I share in more detail than we have time on this interview, but lots and lots of struggles with this Jesus. Walked away from it once, came back because God would not let go of me. And it finally boiled down to one question, Laura. Why? Why would a holy God want somebody like me, an angry, bitter, 17-year-old punk? God knows what I've thought, knows what I've said, knows what I've done to others and others have done to me. I cannot clean up good enough for a holy God, and I am never, ever, ever again going to play the game of trying to be the cutest puppy dog in the foster care window. I'm not doing that again. So why? And I'm paraphrasing here, so for the theologist listening, give me grace. But I read where Jesus said, if you honestly believe in me, and you honestly ask God to forgive you for your sins, it doesn't make you good enough for God. It makes you acceptable. In other words, when I die and I step into eternity, and God says, Robbie, why should I let you in? Jesus is going to come stand beside me and say, Abba, Father, he's with me. And God's going to say, that's acceptable. So not of my own ability, but because I'm with Jesus. And I don't remember the day, but it was the fall of my senior year in high school. By myself in the orphanage, I prayed a very simple prayer. And I said, Jesus, if you're real and you'll forgive somebody like me, and you can clean somebody like me up, and I see it, and I feel it, and I know it's going to be process, then I'm yours. And I didn't hear angels sing, and I didn't fall on the floor in spiritual ecstasy. But I'm telling you the truth, in a moment I knew, I absolutely knew, that the holy God of the universe had reached out of heaven and touched the heart of an angry, bitter punk in an American orphanage and began to change my life. And that simple prayer 
seemed like the catalyst for completely seeing your life be changed. And so will you share now more of that journey of growing closer to God? So my first hero in life was actually long before I became a Christian. It was Booker T. Washington, um, his book Up From Slavery. Booker T. Washington was born in a, you know, African slave here in America, slept on a dirt floor, never knew his father. I don't know if his mother knew his father, uh, but went on to become high school educated, college educated, and segregated schools, obviously, founded a university. And there's so many things about him that impressed me. Just two I will mention. One in the front of my book is a quote of his, character, not circumstances, make the man or the person. But one of his spiritual disciplines was every day to read a chapter in the book of Proverbs, because there's 31 chapters there. So every month he reread the book of Proverbs. So I incorporated that once becoming a Christian, and I'm 65 and a half years old, and so whatever the math is on that, I've been reading rereading Proverbs now for all these years. I have much of it memorized, but I try every day to open my devotions with reading a psalm, a hymn from the hymnal, the traditional hymns. And I love contemporary Christian music, but I love the traditional hymns as well, because they just have such good theology in them. And then I do my devotions, and then I try and do my prayers. I have a prayer list of 250 people that I pray for. That's a true list. Then I try and stop and see if God has something he wants to say to me. And God rarely speaks to me, but if he does, it's a word or phrase I know is not my own. After accepting Christ, the second most important part of my spiritual journey was a year that I volunteered in the Congo on a mission field. And there's a chapter in my book on that where I had to make a split decision whether or not to trust an Mbaka tribesman. And I made the split decision to do it so he would save face. But it was the first time I trusted somebody besides Noah and um, my poor, wonderful grandmother, Gigi. And that was a major step in opening up and beginning to trust other people. The third major step was when I came back from the Congo for my junior and senior year, God called me to forgive. I didn't want to forgive. I didn't think I had the strength to forgive. But it's the chapters that catch most people off guard of all the thousands of communications I've received over the years since the book was published. That's the one I hear the most about. And I decided there were three people I needed to forgive. My grandmother Mitchell for her apathy, my father for his suicide, which was abandonment, and then my mother for her chaos. And I took grandmother Mitchell first because she was the easiest my mother was the hardest, not because she was a woman or she was a mother, just because she was the one who wounded me the most over and over and over again. And what I learned in forgiving Laura, Grandmother Mitchell was dead. My father was brain dead, so they never knew they were forgiven. I tried, I, I hunted my mother down twice on the streets of Chicago to tell her she was forgiven, but she was so out of her mind that if I would even said it, she'd have exploded and said she was the finest mother in the history of all mothers. So the three people I needed to forgive and that I did forgive never knew they were forgiven. But forgiving didn't free them. Forgiving freed me. It freed me of the anger and the rage, and it freed me unto hope and unto a sense that I could really honestly become the person God imagined I could be. And I can tell you straight up, I was in my early 20s, so it was more than 40 years ago, and that anger and that rage towards those three people has never, ever, ever again shown up. Praise God. Praise God. That is supernatural, and that does point to him, because I think we all intrinsically know we're supposed to forgive and we're called to forgive. But it isn't as clear what that process looks like. And you did lay it out from such personal experience. You laid it out so beautifully in your book. And is there anything else that you would encourage us with that you have personally learned about forgiveness? 
I think what I would say is the hardest person to forgive, and there's two, oftentimes the hardest person to forgive is yourself. And part of how I lay out the chapters, and thank you for those kind words, is you have to decide who do I need to forgive, but what do I need to forgive them of? It's not just a matter of saying I need to forgive my father. No, what do you need to forgive your father of? And there may be more than one it's. But the same goes for yourself. What do you need to forgive yourself of? What are the it's? And start with the easiest one first and work on the hardest one later. And then the second hardest person to forgive is the person who keeps wounding you, whether that's a spouse, a child, a parent, in-law. You know, when people think of bullies, they think of people in, in South L.A. with gang tats all over themselves. No, you can have little blue-haired ladies in church who will slice you with their words in a heartbeat. And they are just as much bullies as a guy with gang tats. So in that vein, what's important is to also deal with guilt. And I'm, again, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to give you and your listeners something that way. When you feel guilty, the first thing you have to do is identify it. I am feeling guilty. Okay. Number two, what are you feeling guilty for or about? Number three, what is the standard of measure that I feel like I am failing? Number four, is it a valid standard of measure? It may not be a valid standard of measure. Just real quick, I'm five foot ten. I've got a buddy's five foot ten. I've been a weightlifter for 50 years. He's a soccer player. I outweigh him by 60 pounds. If he weighed what I weigh, he'd be obese. If I weighed what he weighed, I'd be emaciated. Our weight is the wrong standard of measure because of our body types and because of his muscular skeletal system. So weight for us is the wrong standard of measure. Body fat's the right standard of measure. Not BMI either, by the way. But the fifth part of handling guilt, have I given that person permission to judge me? So again, real briefly, see the guilt coming, define the guilt, define the standard of measure you're being judged by, validate that standard of measure. Is it a valid standard? And if it's not a valid standard, just stop and throw it away. But then also say, have I given that person permission to judge me? And if not, walk away from it. That reminds me of what I was even reading this morning, and it's in Second Corinthians in, I believe, chapter 7, because it's talking about the difference of worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, which in my mind makes sense as false guilt or true guilt. Uh -huh. But it says in Second Corinthians 7, verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Amen. Are you aware if every listener paid only $1 per month, it would completely offset all the costs associated with bringing you fresh episodes for the Savvy Sauce? The easiest way to show your support is by becoming a patron. This simply means you pay a small monthly fee, and in return, we offer you some incredible gifts. As a $5 per month patron, you will instantly be able to access over 25 bonus secret episodes. These include topics such as his and her desires in the bedroom with Dr. Jennifer Conson and personal stories of God's provision with Hope Ware. And new episodes are going to appear every month only for paying patrons. You also will gain access to over 10 downloadable scripture prints from Ange at Jars of Grace. And these new prints appear every quarter exclusively for paying patrons. You can hang them in your home, use them as a backdrop on your smartphone, or just tuck them in various places as fresh reminders of God's refreshing truth to remember throughout your day. We hope you take action now by visiting thesavvysauce.com, clicking the Patreon tab on our website, and then clicking Join Patreon here. Enjoy. Rob, moving on with your story, I think most people have not fared this well like you did after 
surviving a childhood that was so traumatic. And so will you walk us through what that journey looked like from eventually you graduated with a degree in social services and then ended up as one of the most notable financial advisors? So, uh, yeah, it was as much of my life sort of an odd journey. I'm not a big country music fan. I'm not anti-country music, but there's a song I like, just concept. God bless the crooked road that brought me back to you. I certainly understand the crooked road. So when I was in the orphanage trying to figure out how not to be a kid from an orphanage, uh, we weren't taught any life skills. We didn't know how to balance a checkbook, run a budget, nothing. It just, they didn't do it then. So before I became a Christian, I thought money would save me. So I started working at 12 years old, shoveling snow, detasseling corn, baling hay, mowing yards, washing cars, working in a lumber yard. And by the time I was 16 years old in 1970, I had $3,000 in the bank. Now, most kids that age would blow all their money, but I didn't. I saved almost all of it, in part because I didn't want the other kids to know I had that much money. And I got tired of what I was making in the bank. So you can't have a, a brokerage account until you're 18 years old. So a lawyer agreed to be my uh, custodian. And on a business day one summer, we went to his broker in downtown Chicago. And I said, what stock should I buy? And he said, well, buy at least two companies whose products you like. So being a 16-year-old red-blooded heathen, and I emphasize heathen, from Illinois, I bought two Illinois companies whose products I was a consumer of, McDonald's and Playboy. And those are my first two stocks. Eventually, after becoming a Christian, I did sell Playboy. So... I laid a fleece out after college thinking I was going to be a youth leader. What seminary do I go to? How am I going to pay for it? And a door opened to sell point of sale terminals. Think of them as computerized cash registers from a company that was really in front of NCR and IBM at the time. I did very well, got cocky as young men do, bought into a different business and lost my shirt. So now I'm 30 years old. My wife's at home, little baby girl. What am I going to do? I like sales. Went to the library. This is before the internet. The highest paid sales position was vice president of sales and marketing. I didn't think I had the social skills for that. Next were manufacturers reps, but they travel 32 weeks a year. Didn't want to do that. Third highest paid were stockbrokers. Well, by now I'd been investing in stock market for 14 years. I'd never been impressed with any stockbroker I'd ever had, so I said, I'll be a stockbroker, and interviewed with all the firms, and E.F. Hutton hired me, and I had no clue how hard it was to build this business when you had no connections, no family money, nothing, but I persevered and um, now have over $300 million in client money under management and uh, love what I do and who I do it for and do it ethically and have a super clean compliance record with the federal government that anybody can look up. It's not always fun, especially the last couple of months in the the COVID bear market, but um, when it's good, it's fabulous. And we give about uh, 20 to 30 percent of our pre-tax income away, pay about 40 percent income taxes and save 10 percent still and enjoy the rest. So we live way, way below our means, but have a, a good life nonetheless. Oh, thank you for being so transparent with that. I think not only is it inspiring, but I also hope that it does offer hope to someone who maybe their childhood wasn't the picture that they wanted, and now they can see a picture of a hero of where they can aspire to be. But we've spent so much time talking about your past. Let's move to the present. You've mentioned your wife, Susan. So will you just give us a glimpse into your marriage and your parenting? You're probably familiar with the radio personality, Delilah. So she and I had lunch one day, and she was laughing. She said she read the part about when I first met Susan, she was the most beautiful female I'd ever seen. And she said, yeah, all men say that in writing until she saw the picture of Susan. <laughs> and let's get real. I mean, she, she makes Barbie doll look modest. She's wrecked the truck gorgeous. And one day somebody asked her, why, why did she marry me? And she said, 
all the boys she dated either wanted to abuse her as a doormat or put her on a pedestal. And I said, I wanted someone as a partner to run through life with. And she was completely taken back by that. So we just celebrated our 40th year of faithful marriage in March of this year. She's the most gracious and graceful person I've ever known in my life. Kind of in some ways, and I say this in all compliment, from the movie Bambi, like Thumper's mother, you know, said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. She was a, a great hands-on mother to our children and now our four grandchildren. We have an adult daughter, uh, married with three kids. She lost one pregnancy. She has an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-and-a-half-year-old. Her husband's an attorney, owns a small law firm about three hours from here. She's at home except two days a week as a vet tech. Our son was an associate pastor, now being moved to a church of, I don't know, 80 to 100, where he'll be the senior pastor. He's also a leukemia survivor, having um, gone through a brutal 40-month protocol, some side effects. He's had both shoulders replaced and hip replaced. So our family has not been lacking in challenges. We lost both her parents in the same year to cancer. She's just a very wonderful, outstanding grandmother. And both our daughter-in-law and son-in-law love her and love coming here. In fact, they call our house Camp Mitchell. And they love coming here, even though we don't have a swimming pool. We just like hanging out. In terms of parenting skills, I really got all mine from Dr. James Dobson on Focus on the Family. He was my mentor, so to speak, although I never had met him. I met him once eventually, but my parenting skills all came from his books and teachings and tapes, and I'm so very, very grateful for his teachings. The one thing I would mention, the two things. One was, he said, don't spank a kid for anything but defiance. You know, if a kid knocks his milk over, that's not worth being spanked over. And I remember one day our, trying to explain our little two-year-old daughter not to put her fingers in the electrical socket, and she stood there, looked us straight in the eyes as her fingers went to the electrical socket. <laughs> My wife's there, I'm there. I'm like, I think that's what Dr. Dobson was talking about. So I popped her hand, and of course she screamed and wailed. But normally we did time out. But the other thing that we did, we talked about a lot. We said, you know, forgiveness is such an important Christian concept. And as you said earlier, Laura, it's not really taught. It's talked about, but it's not taught. And I said, how do we teach our children forgiveness? And so we came up with, normally they went into timeout. And we'd come back to them and say, what'd you do? And they'd tell us, are you sorry? Yes. And so we'd hug them and kiss them. And we'd always say, I forgive you. Now, if they said, no, they're not sorry, you say, fine, you're in timeout. And they'd be in timeout until they finally said they were sorry and we forgave them. But, Laura, there's another component of that, especially for me, quite frankly, is sometimes I'd come home and I'm tired and I'm ill and I'd blow up on something I shouldn't have blown up on. And I'd go back to my kids. I said, look, I was, daddy was wrong. Will you forgive me? And two-thirds of the time, they did. But about a third of the time, they'd say, nope. And so I'd say, well, then I'm going to be like God, and I'm going to zealously pursue you. So every day, until it takes, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. But I'm not going to not ask you to forgive me. And eventually, they always forgave me. Because we needed to teach them how to forgive as well. And I've never read that anywhere in child Christian child rearing book. The importance of teaching your children both to forgive their parents and parents to make forgiveness part of the whole disciplining process. Wow. I love that. And Rob, I enjoyed Castaway Kid so much. And I think ultimately it really taught me more about how to love and experience compassion. And so I'm just curious, have you ever thought about writing any more follow-up books? That was a very painful book to write. I fought God and fought God. And I'd spoken at the children's home. I was their largest donor for years. I spoke at a fundraiser in 1990. The 
director said, oh, by the way, you were never a ward of the state. So my mother had legal custody. Then one of my rich Atlanta relatives got legal custody and still kept me there. So because I was never a ward of the state, I could read all of my caseworker notes. Well, your kids have photographs and videos and all sorts of things about their childhood. I've got caseworker notes and psychiatric workups. That's my childhood memories. So I wasn't expecting much, and I took them to where I was staying that night, went through it, and I must admit I teared up a little bit on some things, but what really struck me was how wrong the adults had certain things. And I tagged a few things to uh, be photocopied, and I kept thinking that night, if you ever wrote a book, nobody would believe you, which is why the very beginning of my book is a page directing the reader to a website called A Million Little Proofs, because I didn't know the name of the, of the book once it was published, but in there are PDFs in chronological order of the entrance notes when I was put in the children's home and other stuff, my kidnapping, my psychiatric workup, a letter from the mental hospital where my father was, one of the discharges from my mother from a psychiatric hospital. And uh, some recordings, one of NOLA, one of my caseworkers in my angry teenage years, the children's home secretary who was there the day I was dropped off and the day I walked out. And then years later, a missionary found Dapala, the Mbaka tribesman. So there's a, a short recording of him in Mangala and then a translation of it. This thought of writing a book kept nagging me and nagging me and nagging me. And I quite frankly, I kept telling God, you can't make me. I'm not going to do it. It's going to hurt. And I don't remember the day, but it was the summer of 1994. I was in a lot of stress. I finished my prayer time. And I said one more time, please take this idea of a book away from me. It's my ego out of control. You can't make me. And then I sat to listen, and God spoke to me so clearly. It was one word, Laura. And he said, begin. And I knew what he meant, and I knew it was God because I didn't want to do this. And most books are written on proposals. You give a proposal, the publisher agrees to it, they give you a third, you write the book, you turn it in, they accept it, they give you another third, they publish it, they give you the other third. This was going to take a lot of work and a lot of pain and a lot of thought because part of what I wanted to do was really take you, the reader, into our world. I mean, specifically my world. I'm not trying to make this any other kid's journey, but into the world of the castaway kid and the confusion and the anger and the rage. But also, ultimately, the turning point was salvation and hope and forgiveness and make it profoundly real and raw and honest and and not make myself out to be a saint because I wasn't. And so it took me 12 years to write this book before I even shopped it. Now, if God leads me again to write a book, I will. But at the moment, I haven't had any sense of leaning to write another book. I can see why it was, as the reader, it was so obvious that it was his leading, because I can't imagine going back, re-experiencing all of that and documenting it. But he has certainly used it for countless lives. And so that book came out in 2007. And so what has life looked like since that point? I would say my, you know, my non-business ministry went from local to international. Prior to COVID, I travel around 12 to 18 weeks a year all over the world speaking. What little I ask for typically barely, it might cover expenses, but I don't make money speaking. I just want to make sure that The people who bring me in have some skin in the game. And I tell the groups, look, if I'm coming, say, to a fundraiser, that's fine. But what I really want you to do is put me in front of at-risk kids and jam me up to places that could never even afford to write a check for $25. And I'll pay for my hotel and dinner and all that out of my own pocket. But I don't have the time to make those kinds of things happen. So... In America, I think the most I've ever done was up in Grand Rapids, where I spoke 16 times in three and a half days. One trip to Guatemala, I spoke 26 times in six days, and that was through interpreters. And I'm exhausted, and I'm juiced at the same time. 
especially when I'm in foreign nations or when I'm speaking to non-Caucasians. I spoke, the last group I actually spoke to was virtually all non-Caucasians because I'm as white as you can get. And so I always open those sessions up with, I said, look, let's get something off the table, done with, behind us. How many of you are wondering what a rich old white guy has to say that's possibly worth your time? And all the kids' hands go up and all the staff's hands go up too, usually. I say, good, we got that one off the table. Let's move on. I did that up in Detroit at a boys' prison, and the administrator didn't even want to let me in once she saw me. I said, just give me five minutes. She said, you got three. We're going to have a riot. I said, fine. She said, fine. And those boys kept me for three and a half hours because they're only used to rich people being drug dealers, rap stars, or sports celebrities. And they're not used to someone. And I always wear my $5,000 custom-made suits. I want to look so wrong for this story so that I fracture their hearts, minds, and souls as they're sitting there going, this dude has walked the walk. He can talk the talk, but look at him. He's rich, but he's one of us. Okay, he may not be black or brown or mixed or who knows what race I am, but he understands. And look at him. How did he get there? How did he become whole? And then if he became whole, is there still a chance for me? And if I can raise that question with these broken, angry, bitter, at-risk kids, it's been a good God day. Amen to that. And I think clearly God has equipped you with all of these gifts that you are choosing not to just hide in this false humility. But when you open and use those gifts that he's given you, it does give praise and glory and honor and acknowledgement to him. I'm also curious I'm just hearing this theme of generosity in your life. So going back during this talk, you said that your pre-Christ days, you thought maybe money was the solution or an answer to kind of saving you. But now you willingly give it away. So Uh what have you learned about generosity? In part, being generous financially is incredibly freeing. It's just not an issue. I mean, I have to be wise because there's a zillion hands out there. One of my clients, it's it's too long a story, but one of my clients whose husband tragically died young, and we had a big life insurance policy on him, after she kind of caught her breath and two young kids and all that, started feeling very guilty about how much money she had. I suggested to her that out of her tax-free bond portfolio, she give away all the interest each year. And we're talking six figures, just interest. And she loved that idea. I said, retain the principal, just give the interest away. I said, but let's do it anonymously. So we worked it out with her law firm, and she chooses the charity. We give the money to the law firm. The law firm writes the check to the charity. The charity gives the receipt to the law firm. The law firm gives it to the widow. For the tax return. Well, these charities are all over the law firm to know who the donor is. And the law firm does what, exactly what I want them to do. I say, it's none of your business. Because they, then they'd be all over this widow, wanting her on the board and this and that, hit her up for some more money. So a lot of what we give away is anonymously because we don't have an ego need here for people to know where the money came from. You know, that's kind of what Jesus was talking about when he said, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. It's just very freeing. We just have to always think through the bigger gifts. Is this what God is calling us to do here? You know, being generous is very freeing. I love getting that glimpse into your thought process. And I just remember especially finding it neat in your book to read the conversations that you had with God And you just recorded your honest thoughts and how you witnessed his ever gentle and wise responses. So I would love to know some things that God is teaching you currently. I think the biggest thing for me right now could be summed up 
in three words, age with grace. So I'm in the fourth quarter of my life, and I'll tell you quite frankly, I'm not happy about being this old. I'm not ancient, but I'm not happy being in the fourth quarter of my life. I have things I really would rather have, think I had 40 or 50 years left to accomplish. And I know I don't. Because of my poor living conditions when I was one, two, three years old in rat infested apartments with lead paint, I have um, respiratory issues. So COVID is kind of like pig pen's dirt cloud, except I can't see it. So I, when I get those clouds of, as a great hymn has a phrase there, depart the clouds of sin and sadness. You know, I oftentimes have to say, you know, God, just help me age with grace. So in my business, I've been on a long process of preparing my team, you know, for that day that I either have to walk out or I choose to walk out. I don't have plans to walk out, but, you know, I'm going to have to one of these days. And so age with grace. Um, the second thing is to be intentional with my grandchildren, especially my oldest one, James. He's eight years old, but he's incredibly smart, and he will easily go to college two years at least, if not three years earlier than norm. I mean, he, he may very well go to college at 15. And I want to make sure that I have built some good memories with him at eight, because emotionally he's eight, so that when he hits puberty and doesn't want to necessarily hang around grandpa, they call him Poppy, um, that I've I've woven some threads in his memories. So those are the two things I would say that God is working on me, to age with grace and to be intentional with my grandchildren uh, so that I'm weaving threads in the tapestry of their lives. Thank you for sharing that, Rob. You're such a deep person, and you are also very practical. So I have this one last question. We're called the Savvy Sauce because savvy is synonymous with practical knowledge or insight or discernment. And so as my final question for you today, what is your Savvy Sauce? My Savvy Sauce, which is heavy, is you can't change the past, you don't own the future. But no matter your past, you own today. The mark of a person is not only how you act, but how you react. That you own. And there is nothing that others have done to you or you have done to yourself that God cannot forgive and then help you rise above it to become the person God imagines you can be. Thank you for that. I just think it's so fascinating going back, hearing you mention some of your heroes in your book and even in this conversation, such as Corey Ten Boom and Booker T. Washington, but you learn from them simply by reading their books. And it makes me even more zealous to encourage our daughters to read these types of books. And I just want you to know, Rob, Yours is going on that special bookshelf that I have set aside for books that I want to encourage them to read when they get a little bit older. But that's because you are a modern day hero. I just want to say thank you for stepping into God's grace and courageously sharing your remarkable story. It was such an honor to speak with you today. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you for this opportunity both to get to spend time with you and hopefully encourage your listeners that if God can work in the life of Robbie, imagine what God could do in their lives if they would but let God. One more thing before you go. Have you heard the term gospel before? It simply means good news and I want to share the best news with you, but it starts with the bad news. Every single one of us were born sinners, and God is perfect and holy, so he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, we're separated from him. This means there's absolutely no chance we can make it to heaven on our own. So for you and for me, it means we deserve death, and we can never pay back the sacrifice we owe to be saved. 
we need a Savior. But God loved us so much, He made a way for His only Son to willingly die in our place as the perfect substitute. This gives us hope of life forever in right relationship with Him. That is good news. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live and died in our place for our sin. This was God's plan to make a way to reconcile with us so that God can look at us and see Jesus. We can be covered and justified through the work Jesus finished if we choose to receive what he has done for us. Romans 10:9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place. I pray someone today, right now, is touched and chooses to turn their life over to you. Will you clearly guide them and help them take their next step in faith to declare you as Lord of their life? We trust you to work and change the lives now for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are declaring him for me, so me for him. You get the opportunity to live your life for him. At this podcast, we are called Savvy for a reason. We want to give you practical tools to implement the knowledge you have learned. So you're ready to get started? First, tell someone. Say it out loud. Get a Bible. The first day I made this decision, my parents took me to Barnes & Noble to get the Quest NIV Bible, and I love it. Start by reading the book of John. Get connected locally, which basically means just tell someone who is part of the church in your community that you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm assuming they will be thrilled to talk with you about further steps, such as going to church and getting connected to other believers to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you too, so feel free to leave a comment for us if you made a decision for Christ. We also have show notes included where you can read scripture that describes this process. Finally, be encouraged. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heavens are praising with you for your decision today. If you've already received this good news, I pray that you have someone else to share it with today. You are loved, and I look forward to meeting you here next time.